Flying an ILS approach allows the pilot to descend to the lowest altitude over the ground compared to any other kind of approach. ILS approaches are usually aligned with the runway centerline. We'll explore the instrument landing system in detail in this lesson. In this lesson, we'll look at the components of an instrument landing system, go over the theory of operation, show cockpit indications, look at the plan and profile views on an instrument approach procedure, and look at ILS minimums. Finally, we'll discuss how the ILS approach differs from two similar types of approaches, called LDA and SDF approaches. An instrument landing system is made up of a localizer and glide slope as the primary navigation aids. Most ILSs will also have marker beacons or compass locators in addition for ranging information. ILS components also include the approach light system and runway markings. We'll look at each of these over the next few slides. The localizer provides left and right course guidance all the way to the missed approach point. The localizer signal is emitted from the localizer antenna, usually located at the departure end of the runway. The localizer uses a VHF signal, which means that its usefulness is limited to line of sight. The last digit of the localizer frequency is always odd. So a localizer frequency could be something like 110.3, 110.5, 110.7, or 110.8. Megahertz. A localizer is four times more sensitive than a VOR, so full-scale deflection on a localizer would mean the pilot is two and a half degrees off an ILS course, rather than ten degrees off a VOR course. The glide slope provides vertical guidance all the way to the missed approach point, and in special cases, all the way to touchdown. The glide slope is not connected to the localizer. It is a separate signal that is transmitted from the side of the runway and upward. The glide slope uses an ultra-high frequency signal, so its signal will not be usable as far as a localizer signal will be. Even though the glide slope is unconnected to the localizer, the glide slope's frequency is paired to the localizer frequency. This means that even though the glide slope frequency is different, when the pilot selects the localizer frequency, the radio will automatically tune its glide slope receiver to the glide slope frequency. The glide slope frequency is not displayed to the pilot. Marker beacons are transmitters that emit a vertical signal that is very tightly confined. Marker beacons are used to provide the pilot with the range information to the airport. The image on the slide depicts marker beacons as shown on an actual instrument approach procedure. In this example, we have an outer and a middle marker. Notice that at the outer marker, there is an altitude. This provides a critical redundancy to the pilot so that they're able to check to see that their altimeter reports the same altitude as depicted when overhead the marker beacon with the glide slope centered. If the altimeter indicates differently, the pilot may be using the wrong altimeter setting. The altimeter may be inaccurate or the glide slope may have failed. There are three types of marker beacons, outer, middle, and inner. In the cockpit, the pilot can identify marker beacons in two ways. First, there is a corresponding light to each type of marker beacon. The outer marker is blue, the middle marker is yellow, and the inner marker is white. Second, there is an oral indication. The outer marker emits long tones. The middle marker emits a short and then longer tone at a quicker pace and the inner marker emits very short tones rapidly. Where radar service is available, marker beacons are being phased out of the ILS systems. Sometimes an ILS system will have a compass locator instead of a plain old marker beacon. On this image, you can see what a compass locator looks like on an instrument approach procedure. The compass locator is a very low power NDB station paired with a normal marker beacon. You must have an ADF receiver to use the NDB functionality of a compass locator. The advantage of the compass locator is that because it's an NDB, you can navigate to and from it. For example, on this slide, there is a compass locator at the Livermore Airport. Notice that the missed approach procedure uses the NDB, and the pilot must have an ADF receiver or GPS to 
perform the mist approach procedure. Most runways served by instrument approach procedures have approach light systems. The approach light system allows the pilot to transition from instrument flight to visual flight more easily. In addition, straight in approaches to runways with approach light systems allow for lower visibility requirements, becoming part of the runway environment. This means that you can descend from the decision altitude to 100 feet above touchdown zone elevation when you have the required in-flight visibility and the approach light system in view. Without an approach light system, you would need to see another, less visible part of the runway environment. Approach light systems were covered previously in Lesson 13. Runway markings are part of an instrument landing system. Runway markings allow the pilot to see the touchdown zone more clearly and allows the pilot to see the width of the runway along with how much runway has been used. Although the same navigation receiver is used, the ILS operates differently than a VOR. A localizer course is not a radial. The image on this slide shows a localizer system. The localizer transmits a single beam of energy that has two components, a 90 Hz side lobe and a 150 Hz side lobe. These two lobes of energy are precisely shaped to overlap equally along the extended centerline of the runway. The localizer receiver compares how strong the received 90 Hz signal is to the signal strength of the 150 Hz signal it's receiving. If the receiver hears all of one side lobe signal and none of the other, the indicator will show a full-scale deflection, either to the left or to the right. If the receiver hears equal amounts of the 90 and 150 Hz signals, the indicator will show centered on the course. The glide slope works the same way as the localizer. Glide slopes are also signal strength dependent. However, glide slope transmitters transmit in the UHF band for finer resolution of the signal. The disadvantage of this is that the glide slope signal cannot be received as far as the localizer signal. In the cockpit, the indications given to the pilot when flying an ILS are shown on this image. It's basically a VOR display with the glide slope added to it as a horizontal needle that moves up and down. Notice there are also two flags, one for the localizer and one for the glide slope. When performing an ILS, it is critical that you check for flags on both the localizer or glide slope. Some indicators incorporate glide slope needles that will stay centered when the glide slope fails. If the glide slope flag goes unnoticed, this can lead the pilot to think they are still flying the glide slope. The only indication of glide slope failure is the glide slope flag. In this animation, I'm going to show you how an ILS system works. First, I'd like to point out some of the components of the ILS, and we'll start here with this map view at the top. First, we have a localizer transmitter. It's basically an antenna array at the end of the runway, and it shoots out two beams of energy. And these beams look sort of like this. Here's the blue side, and here's the other side. Also, there's usually a middle marker or fan marker and an outer marker. The CDI indication here shows us centered when we're right on track, right on runway center line. The glide slope will center when the aircraft finally intercepts the glide slope signal. So here what we can see is the aircraft is on the center line, shown here, but it's below the glide slope. This causes the needle to be deflected fully up, telling the pilot to fly up to get on glide path. Notice that the pilot has intercepted the glide path now and is still on center line. We're going to let it fly past the glide slope so you can see what it looks like. And now you can see clearly that the glide path or glide slope is below the pilot and that's a full fly down indication. Now we can see what it looks like if the pilot is to the left of course but correcting. In this case we have a full fly right indication saying we're more than two and a half degrees off course and we're below the glide slope. So let's correct the course. Now the pilot captures the course and glide slope, but 
makes a mistake and flies past the course. In this case, we get a fly left indication. He's also missed the glide slope, which is now below us. Here the pilot's approaching from the other side, and notice it was full fly left, now centered. Again, a mistake is made flying past the course. In this slide, you can see what the actual energy beams really look like. They're really lobes of energy. So there's a lobe going this way at one frequency, and a lobe on this side at a different frequency. So the aircraft's receiver, what it can do, the ILS receiver, is it can detect this frequency and that frequency separately. So if the aircraft were to be placed where it is now, full fly right, it would only be picking up this frequency. If it's over here, it would pick up the other. But if it picks out equal amounts of both, then it must be on the center line. And this is just to help you visualize the needle movement to the localizer. Here is the plan view of an instrument approach procedure. The plan view of an ILS shows the course to be flown, fixes along the ILS, the localizer frequency, and a depiction of the terrain with obstructions. The profile view of an ILS shows altitudes to fly when established on a segment of the approach. Also shown are step-down fixes along the way if there are any. The minimum section of the ILS appears at the bottom of the chart. This section includes the normal decision altitude and required in-flight visibility, and identifies new minimums in the event of an outage of the glide slope, marker beacon, approach lighting system, or other equipment. In addition to statute miles, visibility can also be shown as runway visual range, or RVR. Upon arrival at the decision altitude, the pilot will either land or execute the missed approach procedure. To descend below the decision altitude, the pilot must have a portion of the runway environment in sight and the aircraft must be in a position from which a normal landing can be made using normal maneuvers. In addition to the ILS, there are two other guidance systems that resemble an ILS but are slightly different. These two guidance systems are the Localizer Type Directional Aid, or LDA, and the Simplified Direction Facility, or SDF. Both of these systems are usually installed as non-precision approaches because they do not usually provide glide slope indications. An LDA is a localizer that is not aligned within 30 degrees of a runway centerline, but has the same accuracy as an ILS localizer. The SDF approach does not have the same accuracy as a localizer. The SDF may or may not be aligned with the runway centerline. On this slide, you can see both an LDA and SDF approach. This is the end of this lesson.